Welcome to episode 28 of the Cashflow Connections podcast. Our topic for today is critical due diligence takeaways from a CRE consultant. Obviously, it's impossible to cover due diligence too many times in the program as it's the most important part of the entire investment process. We have a guest today who has been in the business for several years and has some useful insights to share with us, so we're going to jump right into it. We're going to talk about why it's important to identify your niche in real estate before making your first investment or really jumping in full time. Some of the key items to pay attention to when conducting due diligence on sponsors specifically. What to look for when going through the financials, what to look for when reviewing the documents, and how to figure out if the documents are actually lining up with your expectations or your projections overall. And some of the sources our guest uses to verify claims made by sponsors before investing. So for example, if you have a sponsor that says, we're anticipating this amount of employment increase in this period of time, what are the sources you can go to to verify some of those claims? All very interesting stuff. Also, just one of these takeaways helps you while conducting due diligence. The cost benefit is incredibly in your favor just because of the fact that this alone could help make or save you a significant amount of money just by listening to a podcast. Now, while we're on the topic of due diligence, remember that we're almost done with our due diligence ebook, which is a transcription from episode one. It's almost done. We are in the final stages and every single person with a Cashflow Connections account gets a free copy. So if you haven't yet, make sure to go to cashflowconnections.com, sign up for an account. As soon as it's complete, we'll send you a free copy of this ebook right to your email address. Hope you enjoy the show. How's it going, everyone? Our guest for today is Christina Suter, who is the owner of Ground Level Consulting. Since 2002, Christina has helped numerous investors in Southern California and the Western U.S. region. She has helped clients increase profits, analyze deals, perform due diligence, reduce hours of management, implement quality standards, as well as perform several other vital enhancements that smooth out operations and upgrade performance within real estate. She has experience investing in more than $15 million of real estate with over 300 doors during the last 25 years. So Christina, thank you so much for coming on the program today. My pleasure. I always like talking about real estate and thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. want to definitely talk about due diligence. And I know you have a lot of specific suggestions for a lot of investors out there that I'm really looking forward to discussing with you. Before we jump into those, let's talk a little bit about your background. What attracted you to the space in the first place? Um, I'll tell you a story I don't often share. So I started investing in real estate when I was 17. And a lot of people know this part of my story. Right? I was 17 years old. My mom had really poor health. She had to move out of the family house. She didn't know what to do with it. She said, here, take it, take care of it. She literally titled it over to me. So now I owned a house, which I now didn't know what the frick to do with. <laughs> um, and then I rented it out to my aunt and my uncle. And they bought it from me on an installment sale, which I knew nothing about. And of course, lawyers were involved, and so I had to, and I had to, you know, talk to my CPA, which I thank goodness had, although she was definitely not a real estate specific CPA. I learned years later how vital that is. Um, and so I, I was off and running. I mean, it's kind of like, well, then my brother had a condo and he didn't know what to do with it. And I went, well, hey, you know, I got through one piece of real estate, not too bad. So I bought this condo for my brother, blah blah blah. But really, the decisive point for me was I was years later. It might have been almost 10 years later. I had you know, got uh, owned and, and purchased and was renting out different units through that eight to 10 years. I was running a small business and my small business budget was about somewhere like $3,000 a month. My rent was like $1,800 a month. I was hoping to make $3,000 just to cover my expenses and I wasn't doing it. I wasn't able to make $3,000 a month. So about a year later, as I'm struggling through this, maybe it was almost two years later, as I was struggling through this, I went, wait a minute, I'm selling a property that has a million dollars worth of equity in it, which I'm now rolling into another property. And I'm really comfortable. Like I'm really happy. I'm comfortable. I'm totally con you know, content with figuring out what to do with this huge, to me, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but it seems like a lot of equity to have built up over the, over the eight to 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. To me going, I feel really confident and comfortable and easy over here. And I keep struggling to get $3,000 over here. I'm like, is there something wrong with me and money? I'm like, no, clearly there's nothing wrong with me and money, right? Like I'm <laughs> really willing to be, be, uh, have money, own money, be a leader with money. I just clearly am in the wrong business. So I went 
full-time investor. Obviously, this is where I work. Yeah, th- that makes total sense. And I think that a lot of the listeners can make, make uh, you know, relate to that because of the fact that you're just able to grow wealth so quickly and uh, not quickly, but you're so effectively. It is such a, a direct way to grow wealth. And I think that that story paints it very clear- clearly. Uh, when did you really start your, your consultant business? Okay, now I actually started my consulting business probably about, you know, it's kind of weird. I've always had something I'm doing on the side, right? So I've been consulting since 2000. That's when I started consulting. I was I was running the small space, again, small business. I was running the small space and I had over 90 teachers in the space. And I was just renting it out. I was renting it out to karate instructors and yoga instructors and sat songs and meditation groups and all this other stuff. And I had 90 different teachers, all entrepreneurs, all of them trying to create their own business. And they started like talking to me like, well, how do I do this? How do I do that? Like, I'm trying to do marketing. How do I do this? How do I structure my business? How do I get people to show up on time? So I was consulting with almost 90 different teachers at different times, obviously not the same week, but at different times. And one of them finally went, will you just like work for me? And I said, no. I'm not willing to work for you. I don't want to work for somebody else. I'm an entrepreneur. Thank you so much. But I'll consult with you. And so literally, I became a consultant just because I was already doing it. Now, just to finish the story out, though, years later, I had been a business consultant. I had been a professional investor. I had turned over to being an investor and seeing some clients on the side, right? But then I, then I'm my financial advisor. I really believe in mentorship, obviously, because I'm small. I'm a mentor, right? I'm a consultant and a mentor. That's what I do when I'm not doing direct real estate transactions. Um, And so I, of course, had my own financial advisor. And he said, look, why don't you advise people on real estate? And I'm like, I can't do that. I can't advise people on real estate. I'm so used to just doing my own. I can't help other people take on the risk of what it means to do real estate. That would be way too much. And he's like, why don't you think about it? And two weeks later, I went, you know, I've been moving my own money around the board for a lot of years now. But obviously, at that point, maybe almost what, two decades. Um, maybe I can help other people. Maybe it's not that different from my small business consulting. Um, okay, I'll do it. And it was interesting because this was 2007 was when I started consulting with people. Wow. <laughs> so, wow. I was like, everybody had everything, all of us, me included, had everything falling apart around us. So Mm -hmm. the bulk of my consulting sessions at the beginning was literally like, how do you do a short sale? When do you choose to stop making those payments? Do you choose to stop making mortgage payments and intentionally trigger a short sale? Um, Do you, you know, or maybe even trigger a notice of default in order to negotiate with the banks in order to be strategic about either keeping your real estate or not keeping your real estate or, you know, getting a, a principal reduction. And that was the bulk of my calcu- my work. And then we're calculating how much they're losing. You know, every, you know, every month or every two months, we're calculating how much you're losing, how fast, and how are we going to mitigate your loss? And that was most of the conversations were focused on, on that, obviously, until about 2012. Yeah, that's really interesting because that's that's definitely one of the questions I wanted to ask is what do clients come to you for typically? But I didn't really think of that when structuring that question, that that's probably changed significantly over the years. Um, so now nowadays, when, when clients come to you, what are they really coming to you for? What problems are they trying to solve or what are they trying to understand more efficiently or more effectively? Most of the clients I have are people who don't like I have money. Like basically my clients, people who are fuller clients of mine. Now I have, I have maybe three different sets of clients. You could call it that, but this particular set, which is the bulk are people who have money of some kind might be only $60,000, might be a hundred thousand dollars. Right. Or it might be up to 10 million. Right. But they're coming in and they, cause after 10 million, the investment model starts to change. So that's why that's my range is right in there. Mm -hmm. Um, People come in, they go, I have money. And I want to invest, but there's so much. It's a shiny object problem, right? There's so many things. Do I do notes? Do I own an apartment building? Do I buy a single family? Do I invest in state? Do I invest out of state? Oh my gosh! Like, do I do do I do trustees? Do I try to buy on the courthouse steps? Do I become a wholesaler? Do I become a 
you know, a, a flipper? Do I, what do I do? Like, what do I, where do I land in this huge field called real estate? And I go, okay, come on in. Let's talk about it. I know I'm not, I haven't done everything in real estate by far. I have not. That's, I can't possibly say that the field is way too big. Um, but I do know a lot about different pieces of real estate and the real estate niches that you can land in. And we spend probably our first three to four sessions specifically talking about where are they starting? Where do they want to end up? Like what are their retirement goals? Their vision, right? Their vision for being in real estate and what real estate will get them. What their risk tolerance is. And how much time and effort do they really want to apply to this process? We come up with an earning goals and then we define from there, what's the right asset class for them to start in? Is it direct ownership? Is it syndications? Is it hard money lending? Is it wholesaling? Is it flipping? Like what is it that will develop a portfolio or a career that lasts for for the next 20, 40, 60 years? And we calculate that forward. We start try to create a strategic plan specifically across that horizon line. Now, obviously, will it change? Yeah, it's going to change. But I figure as long as I've got them shooting for the moon, they're going to land in the stars. And so our intention is to create a long-term plan and then start implementing today. What's the right assets in their portfolio today to feed that plan? What percentage of your clients are direct owners versus passive investors or invest in syndications and, and investment vehicles like that? Wow. Um, I would say, I, you know, I couldn't answer it off the top of my head. I'd say it varies. Sometimes it's 60% are passive. And sometimes I hit a whole slew of people who are like, I want direct ownership. And most of the time, I don't get a lot of wholesalers and flippers. I'm not an expert in that area. So I will be very upfront and tell people, look, I flipped, but I wouldn't dream of teaching it. <laughs> mm. I wouldn't dream mm-hmm. of teaching it. Uh, I've never wholesaled, so I can't possibly teach it. I can teach what I know, what I feel like I have an experience in. So I would actually say it varies between 60 to 40% either direction. It really depends upon what the needs are of the client that's in front of me. Okay. That makes sense. And something you you certainly are an expert on is conducting due diligence, which is really the the topic for today. So let's talk about a passive investment due diligence or active, just depending on how you know you look at the space. But when you look at due diligence, what are some of the first items that you want to check off on a typical real estate investment? That's a really big question. Um, let me break it down a little bit, if I may. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Really big necessary. question. <laughs> um, I do love due diligence. I admit it. I do. I do. I'm a geek. It's true. I'm a total nerd. My husband and right. I both are complete nerds. Uh, we don't look like nerds all the time, but the truth is that's where my heart like lands. <laughs> truth be told. <laughs> Um, also, you know, I mean, I've made mistakes. I've my due diligence, my dedication to due diligence. If I may sidestep for a minute. Uh, like so many of us who've been in the investment field for a long time, I think our dedication and our understanding and our respect for the need for due diligence grows when it hasn't worked. You know, when I I invested in a in a deal in Arlington, Texas, I sold a very nice painting that I had to, and I, it just happened to sell it because that investment asset was ripe to sell. It wasn't a, a it was, I didn't need the money. It's just that particular Russian artist had become really popular. And so I sold it right as an investment asset. And so I take that money and I put it to put $150,000 into a syndication deal in Arlington, Texas. And, um, that deal, which was done through somebody was a friend of mine through my community, blah, blah, blah. That deal ended up having about $500,000 worth of unknown subflooring work that needed to be done. And it pretty much broke the deal. Mm -hmm. And so when you've lost $150,000, like literally lost, I didn't get it back. Normally I get, normally you get your principal back, right? I mean, 90% of the time or more, maybe 98% of the time you get your principal back. You get back what you've put in most of the time, at least I do. Um, I think a lot of people do, except for maybe people who are in riskier areas. Mm -hmm. Um, I went, I didn't know. And how did I miss it? I missed it in the due diligence. I missed it when I looked at the financials. I missed it when he said, 
Like, the, the, this is an example. Right? So I'm trying to walk your listeners through, like, why would we pay attention to due diligence? Here's the story about why. So I'm listening to him. I'm having my meeting with him, which is my first step. You meet with somebody, you talk with them, right? You get the deal from them. You understand it. Then you sign. If you're excited, you, you sign the non-disclosure agreement. Then you look at the financials, you look at the, well, the options, you sign, they send you the marketing piece and the non-dis- non-disclosure agreement. You look at the marketing piece, you decide if they're consistent between their word and the marketing piece. Sign the non-disclosure, they send you the PPM and that, right? And they send you the financials. Then I sit down with all three and I go through all of them. I go through my notes about their phone, my phone call with them. I go through the marketing materials. I go through the PPM and I go through the financials. I am looking for consistency. I am looking for the culture of the investment and the person who's putting the investment forward. And I'm looking for, does it work? And some of the does it work I've missed. This is on this deal. The two things I missed on this deal was it was a 35% return on my capital. Oh my gosh. Doesn't that sound fantastic? Don't you want a 35% return on your capital? Oh my God. How many of us have been there? And then it's like, uh, I forgot that it was over five years. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to take the 35% and divide it by five. <laughs> okay. Right. Like, like, do I do that anymore? No, I don't do that anymore. Right. That's that. Why do, why do we do the due diligence? Why is that so important? Did I know about the oil in Texas and how it rots subflooring in, in units on a regular basis. No. Did I know about 8% vacancy factor in Texas being standard, 8 to 10% being standard and that making such a difference in their capacity to fill the building? No, I didn't. So when I looked at the financials and they had a 3 to 5% vacancy factor, I went, oh yeah, sure. That's true in Southern California. Not a problem. Did I know that property tax in Texas is 2.6 to 2.8% depending upon what county you're in? No, I didn't research that. Right. So there were all these things I missed because I didn't do my due diligence. I didn't get specific about that investment. If they didn't tell me, if the syndicator hadn't told me, then I didn't know. So that's why I do my due diligence. So I look for consistency. I look for culture and I cross check their details. I cross check their vacancy factor. I cross check their assumptions. I cross check the, the growth in population in that area where the asset class is. I cross-check their history. I do a background check on them, which includes criminal. Um, so I have a d- very distinct list, but I'm trying to make it simple and you know repeatable, which is I read their m- materials. I look for consistency, reasonability, and culture. And then I cross-check all the demographics and the mar- market research and the financials. I cr- crunch the numbers on the financials. And I do a background check. I check Google. I check, um, oh, I just lost it. What's that guy? Ripoff report. I check done. I checked the LLC, make sure it's, it's active in, in the state. Uh, heck, I'll even check the property lines on the, uh, on the asset that they're looking to purchase to make sure there's no easements that they've missed. Mm-hmm. So I kind of detailed about it. I tried to bring it down. As small as I could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate that. I actually I want to go back to something because I was kind of interested. Yeah. So the the deal that you were talking about in Texas, they advertised a 35% return, but it was over five years. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Interesting. So it's kind of odd just given that I how conservative or aggressive do you think they're being? I mean, that that is seems to be relatively easily achievable given that that's close to let's say 6% or so. I mean, yeah. what are your what are your thoughts on that? I mean, was that interesting? I mean, usually if you say, when I when you originally said 35%, I was anticipating that you were going to say annually uh, yeah, and that would annually, be like a big red flag too. Yeah. Exactly. Um, that would be a big red flag annually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um I guess they were being conservative in one way, but really they were just saying, you know, this is a buy and hold. We don't really have a real value add strategy kind of thing, despite the occupancy being so high. I I love that you picked it up. Absolutely. It was a three to five to be accurate, right? It's okay. a three to five. So that means that the anticipated return was 10% a year, right? At 35% it. over three years, it'd be 10% a year. Um, the, so the sell date could have been anywhere. The concept was to take the building, which was more than 50% empty, right? 
So you would think it would be selling at a really good price at 50% empty, but it was right. already priced up. I mean, I like, what was the mm-hmm. other piece I missed? Like, what would it, well, it wasn't 50% empty. It was three quarters empty. So what would it sell for? Given that they, they were building the new, building the new uh, sports stadium. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, right. I'm not a sports fan. So I don't mm-hmm. know whether or not it was a football stadium or a baseball stadium. I apologize, but they were building a new sports <laughs> stadium. So many blocks. I, this is sound like every other syndicated deal we've ever seen. Right? The demographics. It's Texas that's going up. Right? right. There's a new sports stadium. So the, everything's going to be pushing up. So we're going to buy this at full retail price. Right. Because once the stadium's in place, then we're going to have more jobs and even more concentration of population. And we'll have this really low vacancy factor and we'll be able to develop this great community. And that's our value add. Right. Yeah, it's a good point. And I mean, just to add something to that, I recently saw a deal. There's a very popular deal going out. I'm not going to say the asset class because it'll kind of give it away. There's a popular deal that's available on the Internet that the returns seem very reasonable uh, in the in the low teens or low mid teens, mm-hmm. but there's a huge development component. And so I went through the documents and found out that the split is inverted for investors, meaning that the sponsor is taking the vast majority of uh-huh. the gains. So yeah. the IRR is in the low teens, but you're taking on all this risk without <sighs> getting compensated for it. And so you look at that and you say 15% return. Well, that's reasonable. Okay. Sounds good. Right. But you don't dig into it. Um, you, you won't really notice that. So okay. sorry to get sidetracked. No, no, but, no, no. Uh, I really can you stop there. Can I discuss <laughs> yeah, financial absolutely. for a minute? I would really love to, um, because that's one of my red flags. It's one of the things I look at when I look at the financials. Right. Not only am I looking for the reasonableness of the numbers, okay, is their growth rent, is their, sorry, is their target for rent growth 3% or 8%? Well, 8% is not very reasonable unless they're doing a true value add to the deal. And then it needs to cap out at 3 to 5%, preferably less than 3 if they're being conservative, right? Because now it's a mature asset. They've done the value add. Now they should be sustaining it. It's a year before a sale, if that's what they're going to do, or refinance. And that assumption should be 3% or less, right? So there's that. There's inconsistency in the finances. But I think the thing that people miss a lot, that maybe even a more sophisticated investor may not be as aware of, or somebody who's done this before, is that exact split. Like one of the things I, when I calculate the finances, I sit down and I create my own Excel spreadsheet. I don't do everything they tell you. I just happen to like using Excel. Okay. So don't be overwhelmed. <laughs> don't, don't, I don't recreate their financial spreadsheet on my own sp- financial spreadsheet. That's way too much work. But what I do do is I look at what are they taking? Well, what's, what are they saying is the gross, in, the gross income or the sales price? And of course, I have to check to make sure I agree with it. And then I take out, as best as I can, I work out their compensation. They get a 2% management fee during every year off of cash flow. Or they get, you know, uh, all expenses returned to them. They get a 4% finder's fee at purchase and a 4% seller's fee at the time of sale. And then there is, and then there's a preferred waterfall. Like there's the pref that gets paid out. And then there's a split. And so they'll say in the financials, they'll say IRR for the project is 35% for the year, right? 35% annualized or 20% annualized. Let's let's do 20% annualized. Oh man, that's great, isn't it? A 20% annualized return. But then when you look at the split, you go, okay, I get my pref of 8%. But then I get 25% right? Like you said, it's inverted. I get 25% of the profit. So even though the IRR for the project is 20%, my actual realized realized return might be somewhere between 10 to 12. And so I find that's common in the marketing. And that's Mm -hmm. a red flag for me. A red flag for me is if they don't put in investor return versus project return, then it tells me a little bit about the culture of who I'm dealing with. If you're not that transparent up front and you're trying to confuse me because so that I don't know what my investor return is, that's actually a red flag for me. Totally agree. And you see that a lot with track record, right? 38% IRR track record. 
Well, Mm -hmm. that would be incredible if that was invested. It's incredible either way, but the reality is you need to make sure that those numbers you're advertising are legitimate net to investors, net of fees, net of costs, Mm -hmm. net of due diligence associations, stuff like that. So let's talk about the property itself. What are some of the, the items you look at when you're talking about just specifically the property? Um, you know, I actually, I, <laughs> I'm old fashioned, I guess. I look at city-data.com. That's where I start. City-data.com is a, basically a, a collection of census data. And so I know it's not, I know it's not the most current, right? And I know if I wanted the most current, you go to John Burns and you pay him his 20,000 for the year to get the most current exact data on a city. I think they have 50 cities. I don't know. I actually don't know, but they have many cities that they can deliver to you the exact data all compiled together. But I'm cheap. I go to city-data.com and I, and I start there and I look at, is the population growing, right? Is what's the unemployment rate right now? And I can, I use their heat map a lot, which if you go to city-data, you can, you can look at demographics, African-American versus Caucasian. You can look at, you know, literally by squares, like this little 10 by 10 block is primarily African-American and, you know, five blocks over is going to be, you know, 50, 50 African-American and Caucasian, whatever it is. So I go to city-data.com and I actually look at what do I think the health is of the general city and the place that that building is. And then if it's a syndication, then usually it's going to be an apartment building right? Or commercial. So then I go to LoopNet and I look at LoopNet and I get a sense for cap rates and what is selling in, you know, class C strip malls. And what's the cap rate for class C strip malls? So I kind of do that. Now, I don't really, I'll be very honest, I don't really fund a lot of development deals. I don't join in on a lot of development deals. My personal background is not in development. My personal background is in buy and holds and buy and flips, right? Value adds, primarily in the residential market. So I have a tendency to be attracted to syndications that are in the residential market. Can I work out a class C strip mall? Yeah, of course I can. Would I be willing to do it? Yeah, I probably would be willing to do it. I just have a tendency to be attracted to the residential. So I'm really focusing on those demographics, employment rate, right? Vacancy rates, growth in the city. What's the city? What's the commerce doing? Uh, What's the Chamber of Commerce doing? What's the city as far as current tax plans and tax bills for doing city improvements? What is going in? What are the permit building permits that are happening? Who, if anybody, is going in that's a larger industry? What are the industry mixes of that particular city? How close is that asset to the largest industry, whether it's a university or like I'm sitting in Culver City and we've got four different offices for Squarespace. I think it's the name of it right here. And the prices in Culver City have been going crazy because there's such a uh, focus. Amazon's going to pick their new headquarters, right? Everybody's guessing, well, what city do I invest in? Because Amazon's bringing 20,000 jobs in. So it's honestly, it's more along those lines. Okay. Got it. And so that's, that's kind of like market, market due diligence, et cetera. And obviously the property is usually something that's not really the main focus, especially when you're looking at a syndication, but are there any property specific as in age of the building or unit type or A class versus B class versus C class, anything that would throw out a red or yellow flag that you may identify in terms of the property itself? You know, that's getting so detail oriented that I, 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 that list it's hard to do without having a deal in front of me. It's hard to do without having a deal in front of me, but it's okay. No, let me let me talk to that. Um, I invest in C grade when I do when I was doing buy and hold is my primary form of investing with apartment buildings and single families and stuff like that. And that was you know before the downturn and before uh, during the upturn, I was doing flipping and value adding. That was more, and I had my my buy and hold portfolio, but I kind of started in residential buy and holds. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Uh, f- back from that day, I have a tendency to be specific about, you know, what is, what was your question? I just lost myself. What was your question? Oh, just in terms of the actual property itself, there's, there's sometimes, you know, you mentioned C-class uh, strip centers, for example, um, you know, some people focus on A-class properties. Some people focus on A-class office. Some people focus on A-class office, but B-class apartments. I just wanted to know if you had yeah. any thoughts on on those type of things, um, given that. 
Okay. Yeah, I'm that's not. that's I'd be very I'd be I'm very I'm looking for the capacity of the syndicator, the capacity of the asset to be moved, and the capacity of the city and the population to support that move. I'm not looking at a class versus C class. I've owned mostly, like I was, was trying to get to, was I own mostly C class apartment buildings. So I don't mind if, like Lily, I've had, you know, gang activity on my properties. I've had a, uh, my property, a partner of mine went to knock on a door at a, of an apartment building and was answered by the guy who answered had a gun in his hand. No you know, way. We've to, yeah, totally. <laughs> we've had to evict people. So I kind of, C class. I'll, I kind of like the Hispanic, my personal like, because I like the Hispanic population all day long. They're family mm-hmm. oriented. They want a good and clean place to live. I like two bedrooms, one bath, two bath. Uh, I like renting out to them. They want to pay their rent and they want to have a home, you know, and they treat it like a home. Personal, that's me. So I don't have an avoidance of A versus B versus C. If anything, when I see something that's an A and already an A, and they want to say they want to turn it around, I get a little confused by that. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That's if a they, good point. Right. If they want to, if they, I mean, like, I, I go, where's the value there? Oh, I'm, we're adding square footage. Okay. Now I understand where your value is. If they're starting in C and they want to move it to B, I understand that. Starting in B, they want to move it to A. I understand that because I'm really looking for how, if, if there's no value add in the deal, then there's very little reason for me to invest in it. I'm not in my world. If I want to own a building that's going to throw me off cash flow, I can do that directly. I don't need to invest through a syndicator to do that. And I don't need to buy through a turnkey provider. There are people where that is perfect for them. I don't need to do that because I have the experience level that I don't need that expert between me and that asset. So therefore, if I'm looking for a syndication, I'm looking for a value add. Totally makes sense. And this is something that actually comes up more frequently than than some of the listeners may assume, which is the debate between those two strategies. And I'm very much in line with you. I think that investing in value add real estate with a stabilized tenant base. So for example, let's say 60% occupied property in a market that's 90% occupied and then the value add is being created by increasing occupants, decreasing expenses, etc. But then some people make the argument that that is one rung riskier than something like a 85% occupied property in a 90% occupied market. But the challenge there is that when you're not when you're buying stabilized properties, in my opinion, you are much more subject to market flexibility and market uh, volatility <clears throat> um, because you're not forcing the appreciation. Now, you may get appreciation, but, but- you're not forcing it. You don't have control over it. Exactly. So like those strategies, I think there's a great time to invest in stabilized properties, you know, 2012 and 13, those, those times in multifamily, those are still happening. But at the end of the day- Right now, I'm actually looking for heavier value add properties, though I want to make sure that they're cash flowing to kind of balance out that risk. Um, well, just my thoughts there no, no, on that I agree. particular topic. Let's let me di- you know, let me turn right here for a minute. Let me diverge sure. for a minute. Um, different value, different uh, investments are more appropriate for different ages, and what I mean by that is literally there's this there's the um, there's the stages of invest as an investor. When you're young, you want aggressive returns. There's lots of shiny objects. You're trying to figure it out, but you're really trying to grow your money. And then you become a middle investor, and now you diversify your portfolio so that you have some assets that are some supporting you in your living, and then you have some assets that are out there and they're being leveraged, and you have a higher risk on those. But then there's a point, and this is you know another story, if I may. I was at this meeting at a, a Cornell uh, alumni event. Um, my sister invited me and this older guy saddled up to me and he probably was about 70, maybe 75. And he saddled up next to me. He said, Hey, I heard you invest in real estate. I said, yeah, I do. He's like, well, let me tell you because you're young. Let me tell you. I own eight, was it eight, eight plexes, all cash. There's nothing (laughs) better than owning eight, eight plexes all cash. I just want to let you know, that's where you want to go. And I'm like, okay, thank you so much. I get it. And is that what I want now? No, I don't want that now. 
I'm in the middle. I'm a, I'm a middle stage investor. I'm not an exit stage investor. I'm not interested in preserving my capital. I'm interested in aggressively growing my capital. So I'm taking on higher risk. But when I'm 75, am I going to want eight, eight plexes that I own all cash? Yeah, it doesn't sound too bad, does it? They send you a paycheck every month and you don't have to worry about it, right? right. You have one property management company managing eight A-plexes that are all, you know, class A units that are returning you, oh, 5% on your money because you have to maintain them as class A. Great. Not for me right now. I've got way too much growth in front of me. Yep. And it's interesting how people who are younger think that all these old guys just don't have any, like any common sense anymore. Right. When those old guys were younger, they were saying the same thing. That's and right. I'm definitely in that stage where at this point, you know, if I could get a hundred year loan, I'd take it and that thing would never be refinanced. But <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, people that I look up to that, that mentality starts to change when you have yeah. a family, you've got bills and mortgages and private school and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. All of a sudden you just really want that reliability rather than the growth. So yeah. it's, it's definitely something that, to take in consideration. Well, let's Absolutely. talk about the the really juicy and fun conversation of okay. the legal provisions and documents. I know that you take a lot of time oh. to review clients, <laughs> PPM, <laughs> etc. So what are some of the, the legal provisions that you really want investors to pay attention to and be careful of and which ones can present a yellow or red flag when they're reviewing okay. those documents. Yeah, absolutely. You know what? I have a I have a little cheat sheet that I use and I'm actually I'm I'm uh if you don't mind I'm going to, you know, go through it here with you. Oh yeah, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, so um if I can, you know, I didn't have it up so I need to bring it up. But um basically I start with the simple thing of, well, what is it? Obviously, you need to understand kind of what it is. But then you want to look at how do I get in? But also, how do I get out? Like there's so many times you can't get out of a deal. So I want to understand how you get out. And then I want to understand after that, I want to understand um how do you get them out? Because there are so many, how do you get the, how do you get the syndicator out? Because a lot of them don't allow you to get them out easily. I'll give you an example of the most extreme version I've seen, which again, this kind of boils down to culture as much as the actual legal. For me, a lot of legal aligns with culture. Mm -hmm. Here's why. There was this guy who did a syndication. He'd been doing I won't tell you the asset class, but he'd been doing this asset class for a while. And he, like literally 40 years. And so his, how do you get them out clause was you had to uh, try him on criminal charges, which he actually had to be found guilty of. And the syndication got to pay for his lawyer the whole time. Now you can only get him out if he was found guilty. Wow. And that's the most stringent I've ever seen. I kind of went, well, I never getting this guy out. <laughs> never. Right. right. So if I'm not happy with him, I'm never getting him out. And he has no intention of ever giving up his seat. He's not interested in my opinion. He's not interested in whether this is working for me or not. He's not interested in whether the investors are happy with what's happening or not. Like clearly what he's stating in that document is I'm not going to listen to you. And the only way you're going to get my attention is if you actually find me guilty of something criminal. So I'm like, okay, do I like that culture or not? But I look for it. I want to, how do you get them out clause? Other things I look for is, you know, supposedly you should have voting rights. In theory, when you sign an, an agreement, whether it's a fund or an LLC, or not an LLC, but a fund or a, a corp or whatever, whatever the entity is, you have voting rights specifically in funds and corps. And what are your voting rights for? Because often it says, okay, investors are not allowed to run any portion of the deal. They're not, they're not involved in daily activity. But then there's a portion in there where it says, what are the voters' rights? Right? What are you allowed to vote on? And I've seen one where there was nothing you were allowed to vote on. You couldn't call a meeting and you couldn't vote on anything. You couldn't vote on getting them out. You couldn't vote on getting on um, when the property was going to sell. You couldn't vote on whether they were going to keep the property or or not for as a long term investment. Like there was 
literally the whole, the whole piece of what were the rights that you had as a, as a shareholder was missing. So all that was in the contract was you had no rights to vote on any of the daily activities. So effectively with that, and with that paragraph missing, what you were left with was no rights to vote. Right. And here's my $50,000 is really what it is. The contract is you give us 50 grand. Right. That's the end of the contract. That's the end of the contract. <laughs> exactly. You give us 50 grand. That's the end of the contract because you have no say on anything. Now, usually there's some minimal rights. If you're upset about something, if you're, um, if you're upset about something and there's enough investors that are upset, a certain majority, whether it's you know, it's a majority or whether it's a super majority, have to get together to vote on something, to, co- to call for a meeting, to have a conversation, right? So normally there's something in there about that. Now, the other thing that may or may not be in there, I just had it in my brain, um, was, oh, oh, a dispute clause. If you have a dispute, something that you feel needs to be fixed, something that is an argument, Now, this is more common in the LLC documents and not as common in the fund documents. So this is a smaller syndication where there'll be a dispute clause. How are disputes handled? I want to sell my shares and you won't let me sell my my piece. I want to sell my piece of the LLC. You won't let me sell it. If there's no dispute clause, then how do you handle having a dispute? So like I like to see a dispute clause. You're supposed to deliver a letter of upset. They have 30 days to respond. You know, if they don't respond within 30 days, you have 10 days to be able to deliver to them something or the other that forces action and you can call a lawyer and, and blah, 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 blah. I like having a dispute clause in my LLC contracts. So sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. Um, I also really like to focus on, I described this before, what do they get paid? Like very specific. I, the, this is one of the consistency things I look for. Right? The marketing materials versus the PPM versus the LLC agreement. The LLC agreement to me is what I'm signing and what's enforceable. So if all of a sudden more pay shows up in the LLC agreement than than is in the PPM, that's a red flag for me. Like if you're going to take a 4% sales fee at the point of sale and you say in the PPM, Oh, there will be a real estate agent fee at the point of sale. But then when I read the LLC, I find out that that real estate, there is a 4% sales fee that goes to a specific partner because they're the real estate agent. I'm like, that should have been called out in the PPM. Mm -hmm. Or if it's not in the PPM, but it's in the LLC only, that there's a 4% sales fee and the person who's getting it is one of the partners. I'm like, that's a problem for me. That's a withhold. And I, I like complete transparency. So that's a red flag for me. So what do they get paid? I like to calculate it all together and I want to make sure it's stated in the PPM and stated in the fund agreement equally. And then I want to do what we talked about before, which is my financial analysis to go, well, what do I really get? What do I get as an investor? If they haven't told me outright, what do I get as an investor? And then I do a follow-up phone call, by the way, after I've read through everything and I've done the background check and the due diligence, if I can't figure out who they are on my background check software, I, I hold that as a question. I then have a phone call and I have a whole series of questions. I call them special considerations. You know, why is this clause missing? Or what does this clause mean in the contract? Or are you telling me that I just want to confirm? I do, I call it Columbo. I just want to confirm. I think I saw in the LLC agreement that the only, the only way investors could possibly have an argument with management is if you're found to be uh, guilty of a criminal act. Is that, did I read that correctly? I just want to understand that. Would you explain that more to me? Right. I, I call it my Columbo deal because and the reason why I call it Columbo is because I don't want to yell at them on the phone. What I want is I want to hear them. I'm now looking for more consistency and transparency. And I'll also say on this final phone call, I'll say, if I can't find them, I said, you know, I do do a background check on all the primary managers in the company. And so I, I know maybe you don't want to give me your social security number right now. I definitely don't want you to email it to me or text it to me. I'm willing to call you later and we can have, like sometimes I'm doing this with clients, right? So I'm trying to protect their personal information. So we will have a phone call and I'll ask for the social security number because I can't find it. Like there's too many John Smiths in my background check, right? Software. Um, and then I'll say, when they gave me the social security number, I'll say, you know, is there anything I need to know about? 
Just one question. And then they'll say, well, you know, during the downturn, blah, blah, blah. Or they'll say, no, there's nothing you need to know about. And then I do the background check. And there's always something there. I've never seen nothing. There's always a a small lean or my one that gets me the one that made me laugh the most was there was a syndicator there was looking a client was looking to fund and they had like 12 traffic tickets and like six of them were, were for speeding <laughs> I'm like okay so the guy drives too fast does he have to drive as part of this part of this deal no his driving record is not directly salient to the deal but this guy likes to go fast is what it boiled down to right Right. So there's always something in the background check. So there's never nothing in the background check. The question is, what is it? And have they been transparent about it? There was one guy who had an SEC violation, you know, and he was very transparent about it. He said, look, you're going to find this. This is what happened. Let me give you the details. And I'm like, okay, I can be very forgiving. And the documents that were found that I was, that, um, I didn't find them. Somebody else found them. But when I reviewed them, the documents that were found about the SEC ruling were that he really was the whistleblower. So even though he was named in the case and he really was, he did have an SEC violation, he was the whistleblower. So, and that's what he told me on the phone and the documentation that I found supported that. So I'm like, oh, good. He was, it, it didn't, to me, somebody might've said, sorry, you have that violation. I, I totally, I can't either, I can't find the paperwork or I'm not sure I can believe you or I don't want to get engaged with anybody who's had that violation. But for me, I'm like, Hey, you know, I've been investing for 30 years. I've had a short sale. I've screwed up. I have. But the question is, did you straighten it out? Yeah. And so uh, I go, you're transparent. Go ahead. No, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I you touched on several things and I wanted to touch on two things that I think are, are definitely important when it comes to the legal documents in particular. Um, something that has come more and more popular, the, the fund model, which cr- includes a lot of properties, mm-hmm. I have found that because of the nature of those funds, the voting rights will be extremely limited because the operational duties of buying and selling multiple properties and requiring inv- uh, investor votes will be very challenging. But what is should never be eliminated is the right to remove the manager. Mm-hmm. And even if it requires a supermajority, and even if it needs to be for cause, and which can be outlined, it needs to be in there. Uh, because to Christina's point, that is something – I've invested in 30 syndications or something close to that. And people don't want to remove the manager unless things are really bad. In fact, I've never invested in a syndication where there's been a vote on something like that. Um, having said that, you want to be able to know that you can in the event that something's going wrong. Mm-hmm. Also – um, something else is that sponsors aren't attorneys. And so sometimes you can find language that may not exactly line up with the culture of the company because the sponsor doesn't really necessarily understand the legal language that they input into their own PPM. And this may sound like, oh, well, don't they know what they're doing? Well, they may know exactly what they're doing. What they're doing may be identifying really great shopping centers in South Florida. It's not understanding provisions. So just make sure that you get on the phone with them. And if you say, hey, listen, there's nothing in here, or the capital call provision, for example, is very aggressive. They need to be able to say, wow, you're right. Let me talk to my attorney and get back to you. And they should be able to make changes in the event that it is. Um, just two, two points, and there's obviously some generalities to make from that, but just want to touch on it since it was two two things. And we've made changes in the past uh, when you know I my attorney, uh, you know, they're they're designed to protect me. Yeah, you know, so the language is going to be uh, in my favor, and it's important to make it balanced. And sometimes it requests some back and forth. Um, now before we go, and I know we've we're running short on time here, but I know that you are really a, a st- student of the economy, and you're recently on a a panel about the state of economy. I wanted to get some of your key takeaways from that panel and and what that conversation really led to. I'd say the the key takeaway was there was one question towards the end, and I can't remember what the exact question was, but it was some version of, you know, do you think we're going to see a real estate downturn soon? And three out of three on the panel said, no, we don't think we're going to see a significant real estate downturn soon. Um, So I'm going to stand on that. I not only does Bruce keep saying that Bruce Norris, who I, I am a Bruce Norris, you know, follower. What do they call him when you, when you have a rock star who's got a groupie, I'm a group Norris groupie. Oh. <laughs> I admit it. I'm a group Norris groupie. Um, 
But I also listen to Robert Campbell and I also get an economic update from my sister who works for Nationwide uh, Insurance. And so she'll share with me her information from time to time. And of course, there's updates from Carr um, and NAR as well. But Carr in particular is the one I listen to since I'm in California. So I, I'm constantly seeking out people's economic opinions. I want to be challenged in my point of view. I don't want to keep drinking my own bathwater. Um, it's too easy to be stuck in the culture and the frenzy of what's occurring. Southern California right now in particular, you know, it's like, oh man, you know, 30 days, 30 days or less on market and three months of inventory, three to four months worth of inventory, you know, we're rocking right now. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Some, the time clock is running right now. <laughs> like, I'm like, this is when I get nervous. This is when I spend more time watching the economy, not less time, because I want to know when the bell's going to ring because that final bell is going to ring and it's going to turn down. Um, I saw a, a um, statement in a news article about three weeks ago now that said there was a 40% increase in variable rate loans that were being closed. And I went, okay, this is the beginning. This is the beginning of the end. This is the beginning of the volatility. This is the beginning of real estate being pushed up. And so therefore, I'm watching Trump's administration and I'm watching where it's going to go. So what's the vote? The vote is that we're probably not going to see a large real estate downturn in the next, I say, 18 months. I, I don't know what Bruce would say. I can't speak for him. He also doesn't talk in months. He talks in affordability. Um, but three for three said, no, we don't think there's going to be a really big downturn. But I am watching because as far as I'm concerned, the bell has rung. I'm more worried about stocks and bonds and the hyperinflation I feel like I'm seeing in that asset class than I am about real estate. But it's only because real estate's being artificially constrained by financing. And when that financing starts to shift, which I'm almost certain that it will, right? I'm seeing more and more ads and more and more indications that alternative or looser funding is going to be available. No doc loans, hard money, uh, hard money people are getting into the conventional space, which require less documentation, have a slightly higher interest rate, but will underfund riskier deals. I'm pretty sure that we're going to start seeing, continue to see forward movement in real estate. But at some point, that bell is going to ring. So I don't know if it's two years or I don't know if it's three years, but at some point, that bell is going to ring. So I reserve the right to update my opinion every six months. <laughs> no problem. And definitely let me know so we can have you back on to have a whole show on that. Oh, By the way, oh, you thanks. mentioned just for the listeners, we do have Robert Campbell is coming on here in a few weeks to talk oh, about. Really? the state of that. And if you get in touch with Bruce Norris, tell him to send me an email. I've sent him a few to request him to come on, but he's <laughs> kind of afraid of the whole podcast thing these days, I guess. But um, let him know. We'd love to have him on to uh, to discuss that same yeah, topic. Sure. Sure, sure, now, before sure, we jump course. off, uh, Christina, definitely let the investors know uh, how to get in touch with you via your social media sure. or email or otherwise. Yeah. GLinvestor.com um, is my website. GL, literally the letters G and the letter L, which stands for ground level because my business consulting is ground level consulting. So GLinvestor.com is my real estate consulting website. And I am also on, let's see, ground level con, C-O-N is my Twitter feed. And I do put out every I try to do it every Tuesday, but sometimes it's Thursday. And I still call it my Tuesday tweet, truth be told. Uh, but I try to put out some good real estate uh, articles that are worth reading. Basically, like I said, you got to keep, you know, the bell, the, the beginning of the end has started. The question is whether it's two or three years. So I do try to keep focused on that. And I do have an Instagram page specifically around Phoebe, F-I-B-I Pasadena. Um, so you can follow the Instagram, which has a lot of pictures from our meeting. And of course, there's FIBIPasadena.com, which has all of our videos from 2016 forward. And you can get a membership there to see our videos from our real estate meetings for what, the last year and a half, almost two years now. Awesome. Well, I will make sure to link to all those. Christina, really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks again. You got it. Thank you, Hunter. Thanks for checking out the episode. Hope you enjoyed it. As always, the links to our guest contact information and their website will be available in the show notes page. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. You can always email me at info at cashflowconnections.com or hunterthompson at cashflowconnections.com. Thanks again. <laughs>